Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. The Observer recently called Will Self's trilogy of novels one of the most ambitious and important literary projects of the 21st century. And by the end of the near 1,500 pages of Umbrella, Shark and Now Phone, it's difficult not to agree. Ambitious because it's impossible to think of any other recent novelistic undertaking that has not only set its sights so determinately on the peaks of linguistic and formal invention, but that also insists on scaling said peaks while dragging a tonnage of moral and emotional weight behind it. And important because in spanning almost a century of British and world history, its wars, its technological innovations, its pathologies and psychoses, it makes a serious attempt to understand the roots of the state in which we find ourselves today. Like the two previous novels in the series, Phone plunges us into the choppy consciousnesses of multiple characters. Among them, uh, MI6 uh, agent Jonathan the Butcher Death, his lover Colonel Thomas, as well as the selfie and bulwark psychologist Dr. Zach Busner, dragging us into one and spitting us out into another without warning, making for a reading experience that is vertiginous, demanding, at times traumatic, but always rewarding, and never, ever dull. In addition to Phone, Will Self is the author of many novels and books of non-fiction, including Great Apes, The Book of Dave, How the Dead Live, which was shortlisted for the Whitbread Novel of the Year, The Butt, winner of the Bollinger Everyman Wordhouse Prize for Comic Fiction, Umbrella, which was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize, and Shark. Metro called Phone a brain-blitzing riff on war, technology and consciousness, while The Guardian's review called Will Self the most daring and delightful novelist of his generation. And the TLS promised there are marvels in store. There certainly are. Please join me in welcoming Will Self to Shakespeare and Company. So let's kick off with the opening of Phone, in a way, like where we, where we find ourselves. We find ourselves in a kind of, um, a kind of a morass of ellipses, in fact, in a similar way to the way Shark ends, indeed. Ah, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, I was very influenced, obviously a bad thing, by Louis Ferdinand Celine, at least, um, in my punctuation, if not my politics, and uh, I've fallen victim to the same disease, which mm -hmm. is an uncontrollable ellipsis, which from uh, Mortecadion came to absolutely typify Celine's, and so the late London novels are mm -hmm. just full of them. But I think the ellipsis is, I like it's, in, the, in Umbrella I had also obsolete Victorian punctuation like coma which I really like comb ashes which is sort of comma and semicolon dash combinations which I think are, 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 do think interesting things with rhythms uh, but also a lot of ellipses and then gradually in sharp the ellipses started to really get mm -hmm. a grip on it and in phone of course the opening of the book is the ellipsis plus an exclamation point, mm -hmm. which is, of course, uh, and two groups of it, which is, of course, the traditional old sort of bring, bring of a phone. <laughs> so, you know, it just is. And I think the ellipsis has come, you know, I remember when you started to see ellipses on plate glass windows to indicate so that people wouldn't walk into them, which mm. was a distinctively late 80s, early 90s phenomenon. It was a kind of extension of Walter Benjamin's conception of vertical type. And in Paris, where, you know, the whole city was wrapped in affiche in the 19th century, it seems like the right place to bring my ellipses <laughs> on tour but i think they are very they're very <laughs> suggestive as well of ticker tape stock market quotations the kind of boop, 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 ceaseless sort of bleeping and beeping of the contemporary mm -hmm. technological world so it seems kind of serendipitous that they've mm -hmm. just grown more and more i couldn't control them and i guess uh, i mean it's sort of unsurprising in a way that there's sort of a trilogy that deal so much with sort of uh, different technologies and the way they've impacted on our consciousness over the, over the course of the last century, that by the time it reaches uh, the 21st century, that uh, the phone should be, um, should be so much of a, a, a subject of the book, in fact. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, in, in a sense, Shark or Requin, in Francais, the, the centre term of the novels is the odd animal out and the other two, the umbrella clearly of, of the first novel. What fascinated me about the umbrella is what a dis good example of, of discontinuous technology it was mm -hmm. that we um, you would imagine the umbrella had been around forever and of course parasols have been around forever but the actual simple retractable umbrella, umbrella system doesn't come in until the 1870s which mm -hmm. seems kind of late considering mm -hmm. that you know 
And I think I always think that kind of the most representative naturalistic genre, literary genre, and narrative genre of our era is steampunk because yeah. it's basically a riff on on the reality, which is that mm -hmm. technology is discontinuous, as opposed to the dream of technology that the 20th century projected as a and then and commodity fetishism impacts upon us, which is of mm -hmm. continuous and uniform novelty. Every new era is a complete substitution mm -hmm. for the last. New Shakespeare and Company. Your shirt was new today. Everything's new, isn't it? Kind of, you know, and, and the umbrella was sort of stood against that and for that kind of. And then, yeah, I, I guess break the sequence. The shark in the in the second novel, in a sense, is an object because I'm much more interested, in a way, in the large plastic shark in Steven Spielberg's film Jaws than I am in any actual <laughs> real shark, which which I think stands proxy in a way for technology in mm -hmm. in the the beginnings of the technology of simulation that in a way comes out of the kind of horror uh, of the mid century mm -hmm. and into a recapitulation of itself and then yeah you know, each novel groups a psychopathology uh a war and mm -hmm. a representative technology and that's the other thing about umbrellas they were manufactured of course when we get to the late 20th early 21st century it was inevitable that we were going mm. to to the iraq war and it was inevitable that we were going with the phone because mm. people did go with phones and you could either patch your phone into the wonky military networks or you could buy a local phone mm. credit or you could get a burner from mm -hmm. the Iraqis. You know, it was a phony war in that way. <laughs> uh, and lots of comms was military communications were through mm. mobile phones. And But really, when you think about it, the era of the Iraq wars was typified by the inception of bidirectional digital medias of all kinds because for those of us who were old enough and remember Desert Shield in 91 what it was notable for was two things the start of rolling news 24-hour TV news and secondly the so-called smart bomb which had a camera in its nose cone so it was the first war where you sat farting in London and watched as Baghdad, central Baghdad, from a, an actual camera eye view of the bomb mm -hmm. dropping on it, going up. Now that kind of footage is positively mm. banal, mm. it's so common, but of course it only began 25 years ago or whatever it is. And if you, in, in a way, if you compare the, the umbrella and the phone, however, there's sort of um, the umbrella is a technology which more or less has remained unchanged from uh, you know, the, its invention till now. Mm. Whereas one of the things that really struck me in the early pages of your novel is how much the phone as a technology has changed and how much the sort of our associations with it have changed as well. So like, there's there's um, there's a moment where you're you're writing about how it used to be when sort of when the the landline would ring mm. in a house and I. I um, the, you talk about the, I think, is the carping self-importance of mm -hmm. the landline and how whatever was going on, people would drop yeah, what they were doing and rush to the phone. It's Busner's mind, of course. Mm -hmm. He's in his late seventies and he's remembering the kind of phone culture of the nineteen fifties. He says that you know the phone, you'd no sooner not answer a ringing phone than you would not stand for the national anthem. Mm -hmm. You know, you would actually kind of get off the toilet and, <laughs> and walk across the hall with a with a turd halfway <laughs> out of your ass in order to pick up a phone rather than leave it ringing. Mm -hmm. But there was a, a, an insistence. And of course then you would be plunged into the most egregious intimacy when you think about it. One, you had no idea who was on the end of the line. It was a, in a sense a completely anonymous call. And it was still a culture which in London where I grew up, you had five fat phone books mm -hmm. In the, in the specially built phone table by the door and I always remember them because they were A to D mm -hmm. and E to K, actually it's in shark because he, he registers it as, as ad eek, mm -hmm. you know, because he's reading the phone directly, and they're fantastic you, take, you might have thought my name is 
uh, fairly unusual. But of course, when I was a child, I could see exactly how many selfs there were in London. There were actually 40 or 50 selfs in the phone book. It was, so population was, after all, 7 million. Most of them were phone subscribers. So you had a kind of weird sense. And again, there's no comparable technology mm -hmm. of that now. Yet the paradox is when you picked up the phone, there you are standing with your turd half out of your <laughs> arse, picking up the phone. I, did, yeah, I didn't want to let that image go. I felt, <laughs> I felt some people in the audience had probably forgotten it. I thought, no, I'll resurrect <laughs> it. Let it live on. Why be polite? Um, you wouldn't know who was on the end of the line, and, and then somebody's tongue would be in your ear. He would be, they would be, their haliotitic breath would be in your nostrils. Their, their, their psychic hand would be on your crotch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a Harvey Weinstein of a medium. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, and it's just struck me how quickly we forget these habits and these kind mm. of because I mean particularly the sort of seeing the the old uh, rotary mm. phone on the front cover that just how in yeah in, in the last what ten fifteen years even I mean a lot of people probably don't even have landlines now and just the and yet we still sort of refer to a lot of the old um, sort of ways of inter interaction with the objects so I mean there's obviously the the ringtones we have some of which are intentionally evocative of mm. of these old phones and it, it leads to a sort of I think a strange kind of cognitive dissonance which Zach Busner particularly has experienced. Well I mean it's a whole I mean it's strange to think of it because the phone is an, is an analog technology so it's the whole series of analog technologies that are that are going out of use and you know what 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 you particularly note the transfer between one technology and the next through is through what we call skewer morphs, which is pre previously functional things mm -hmm. repurposed as decorative. So, you know, classic example, which I used on the cover of Umbrella, is anaglypta wallpaper, mm -hmm. which is actually based on, in the 17th century, if you were super rich, you had tooled leather. Mm -hmm. on your walls so it's kind of groovy leather so that anaglypto of wallpaper which came in in the late victorian era is a skewer morphic version of that but your smartphone is full of skewer morphs the icons on it are skewer morphic and you know an epical moment came the other day when the phone icon it's still on this iphone it's still the baker light handle off one of these but how much longer can it hold out you know or you know why is there a facetime cine camera what's that got to do so it, or even the envelope it, right the but, well. but you know we're at the break point now give it another 15 years and the whole interface of technology mm -hmm. will no longer speak that vocabulary at all it'll mm -hmm. be gone gone and <laughs> it may, uh, I wonder in all of the um, in in each of the three books there is kind of these um, uh, almost sort of totemic illnesses as well which seem to sort of encapsulate a lot of the the effect that the the technology or the the war has I don't had. think I think trouble with perhaps in one of the difficulties for people reading the books and, and it sounds like a kind of tall order to ask of a reader that they abandon some of their most basic conceptions about the world you know <laughs> it's not a case of abandon hope all you hear enter here <laughs> but it's a case of sort of abandon some of your baseline ideas and I think it's very difficult to particularly look at technology which is in a way the kind of test case for this without a profoundly Cartesian mind mm -hmm. the way we like to view technology is we think up clever ideas, mm. then we make them, and it's like cool shit, man. Yeah? Mm. And the negative view is no, it's kind of artificially intelligent, it's taking it over, we're out of control, we don't know what we're making. Mm. The truth is, <coughs> in my view, that we just emanate te technology, that's what we do. We're, we're those kinds of animals, and we've been doing it for an extremely long time. It's part of our being and our being in the world. And it is effectively uncontrollable. I mean, whenever I hear people talking about controlling or repressing technologies that, you know, Marshall McLuhan, I think, summed this up perfectly in understanding media in the late 50s, you know, technology is action at a distance, and no human being foregoes the ability to effect action more efficiently mm -hmm. and more powerfully at greater distances. They just love that shit, whether you're... <laughs> 
old fucking orange hair in the White House or, <laughs> or little rocket man or, or you. It doesn't really matter. We're all the same. But I think the history of the 20th century is not so much that technology causes these mental pathologies. It's that we're all, we've all been going uh, in certain key ways really crazy mm -hmm. for the last... Well, you know, ever since the Industrial Revolution mm. and before. But, you know, who's to say we haven't always been crazy? Mm. We're just crazy in a different way. I just think the 20th century's been, you know, it was gigantic in many different ways. And one of the things it was very good at was its own propaganda. I mean, here we are in 2017 with a, with a you know, having exceeded the carrying capacity of the dirt ball many times over. I don't know if you people believe in the uh, international panel on climate change's predictions, but I certainly do. This week we've had news in Britain of a catastrophic collapse in insect populations. Mm -hmm. Little Rocket Man and Orange Hair are facing off. Mm -hmm. uh, 20 million people have died in the Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo fighting so that you can have a smartphone in your pocket. Uh, it's not really looking good for the rational approach mm -hmm. to technology. You know? And in and in phone, there are two sort of mental conditions, I don't necessarily want to call them illnesses, but there's one which may be clearly an illness, which Buzna seems to be suffering from Alzheimer's or some some form of dementia mm -hmm. and there's then his grandson Ben who is uh, on the uh, autism spectrum mm. and and both of these in a way seem to tie into certain sort of conceptions well, of technology well, yeah it's compensatory I mean these are the representative psychopathologies or maladies or differences if you if you believe in the autistic autistic spectrum that, that have come to characterize our era on the one hand you have alzheimer's which is you know the forgetting of everything well that's not a problem because we've got a device in our pocket that can remember everything effortlessly for us and on the other hand you've got the persistent urban myth that that device is being created by high functioning autistics in order to avoid the messy contingencies of direct emotional relationships and that we're being steadily paralyzed by a convolvulus of cabling directed at us by human automata so you know uh, so, you know, the, you chuckle a little bit because you, you know that you, you too have flirted with such notions mm -hmm. and, and uh, in, in a way both are true, mm -hmm. you know, that the, the, this is the, the historical moment we're in mm -hmm. uh, and, and I, I, I think the transition is, is epical mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the character of Busner in the book says to himself, well, he doesn't believe that it's an actual alteration in the structure of the human brain, which mm -hmm. tends to take a very, very long time indeed. But we've witnessed in the last two or three years phenomena in human mind taken as a collective, mm -hmm. collective thing that are wholly unprecedented, extraordinary popular delusions and madnesses that have a kind of impact, mm. like huge tornadoes oh. swooping, sweeping through the global communication mm. system. And you have a situation, you, you know, you can go back to Ace in the Hole with Kirk Douglas in the 50s for the idea of kind of fake news mm. or virtualized news, but it, it really has kind of freeze-dried mm -hmm. into the political system now. It's become a... So I was just going to ask then, so do you think that what we have just experienced over the last few years there there is a qualitative and quantitative difference from for example popular movements in from the the 30s yeah, well, I, well i don't know about uh, no i mean I think the old paradigms aren't the way of looking at it but certainly comrade stalin was right that quantity has a quality of its own mm -hmm. and i think one of the things that has deceived people about this technological transformation is it, is it is it seems to be taking a long time mm -hmm. uh, and actually it is taking quite a long time and I think why that confuses people is well why is it taking such a long time the answer is because everybody's so fucking old mm -hmm. in the West because like you know the West is old and everybody's like really old and old people just don't take stuff up mm. in you know that's why we're sitting in a fucking bookshop I mean, what's <laughs> that about <laughs> With typewriters around. <laughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Although on the yeah. subject of typewriters, I mean, this is something that you use. Yeah, yourself. well, I, I think that the novel form is it depends on the codex. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what brought it into being. I mean, there's no reason why a text, a digital text,
text needs to be internally self-referential or structured mm -hmm. in the way that a novel is. If you think about a, what you think of as a good novel, its capacity at a psychological and imaginative level to create a world is predicated on the fact that it's physically confined between two covers. The unbounded nature of digital text will never support the novel form because you can just push on a word you don't understand and it takes you to a definition or it takes you to another work of the author or it takes you to the particular reference and if you write on a computer and you're tr you're struggling to think about you know what a particular kind of car looked like then you simply mm -hmm. google it and look at an image of it then, then you're not writing you're describing an image with words mm -hmm. writing in my view literature consists in a perfect gestalt of style and content mm -hmm. and a, and a com high wire act that continuously that, it, that comes from thinking mm -hmm. and imagining and being in the word stream mm -hmm. not in words as a kind of portrait mm -hmm. of some reality in that way so it's the death of the novel as a, a, a central form but we knew that right and so the the, the process <laughs> and the tools have to I mean, uh, when to it, mirror that as well what? The yeah, process, yeah yeah well i mean it, it, it becomes a bit luddite i mean once i realized once broadband came in in 2004 and i realized that just with the you didn't even have to log on anymore and listen to the sort of <laughs> you know kind of hammer of wotan being fed through a kind of weird staticky storm mm -hmm. Uh, you could look at a man with his head up a donkey's vagina in about a second. <laughs> uh, actually, I, ran, I remember in about 2008 running into a writer I knew in London, and, and, and he'd been quite a coming man a decade before. I said, what happened to you? He said, well, the internet happened to me, man. You know, it's, you see, he said, my thing is, is girls in boots with guns. <laughs> he said, before the internet, it was really hard to connect with any girls in boots with guns, but I've basically been looking at them for the last seven years. <laughs> Everyone's going to go back now and try and look who hasn't published a novel in that time no, and no. <laughs> figure out who you're talking about. But, um, mm. but cause, cause one thing I did want to talk about was the actual sort of the the process of writing this novel in as much as I think for a reader and in fact for the the three novels it's quite a it's a very intense experience it's quite the, the lack of paragraphs the lack of chapter breaks is quite a quite an unusual and quite an exhausting yeah I know readers uh, say to me oh I don't know when to put it down you know which is probably <laughs> kind of a true picture of our lack of autonomy isn't it I've been mean, <laughs> a, a text has <laughs> gripped control of me and I now can't put it down even though the phone's ringing <laughs> <laughs> but one thing yeah, I don't think it's often talked about that much. It's kind of the physical exertion, which is, which writing a novel often takes. And this strikes me as sort of particularly as you told us, you were working on a typewriter as well, which yeah, in I was itself I was morbidly certain. obese when mm. I began this one. I'm just gonna, <laughs> uh, well, I, I think it, you know what I say on the unfortunate occasions when I try and explain the writing process to to young people who wish to be writers is. Well, one, I talk a lot about creating the reason that you, even if you're not going to work on a typewriter, print out what you do and correct on the page because you have to create an analogue so that your memory can find its way around something because the business of developing narrative coherence and stylistic mm -hmm. perfection is ultimately when you finish a book, you should know it by heart. Mm -hmm. I mean, completely by heart. So. You know, that is the objective. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah, it is kind of physically demanding, I suppose, in that way. Yeah. And I would say, compared to your previous novels as well, did, was this was this project particularly so because of the because mm. of the rhythm? The sort of, I mean, as a reader, we feel sort of dragged through the I novel. I it? don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know, actually. Once, <laughs> it sounds a bit weird, but, but because it's, you know, written in temporarily discontinuous scenes, you, there are Elysians between characters focalised Organizations that mm. are a split second mm. it tends to give the impression that it's uh, not quite tightly plotted mm. but of course I think if you get to the end of it you realize it's extremely Surely, tightly yeah. plotted so it's just like any other novel I mean I think that slightly is failing at that level is that it has a plot I haven't been able to abandon mm -hmm. you know I think that is the point though at which the reader feels the writer has basically abandoned the whole kind of mm. novel gig the kind of Beckettian plunge into <laughs> linguistic disintegration mm. is not far ahead. Soon you're just going to be publishing books that are like, yay, thick, and they'll say sort of egg 
brain <laughs> dung building he went down mm. you know kind of which i'm all in favor of but you know <laughs> i think we've been down to the dung building mm. already <laughs> and so you consider the, the the existence of some sort of plot as oh, something yeah. of a of a failure on your yeah, part. yeah <laughs> a bit of a failure on my <laughs> part but you know plot plot's useful for saying other things um because I wanted to get the Iraq war in, and I suppose I was very interested in secrecy and, mm. and the secret state, which is, you know, through its alliance with emergent technology mm. has come to create, you know, we never get the dystopia we reckoned on, but mm. there's no question that all of the main dystopic elements, you know, I, remember, I don't know if anybody here is English enough or of the right age to remember a comic called 2000 AD, which of course came out as a minor vision of the future in the late 1970s. But I was with a friend who's a contemporary of mine, and I was sort of saying, Yeah, what about 2000 AD? And he said, Yeah, what about it? Judge Dredd and 2000 AD, it's all completely come true. Mm -hmm. Faceless corporations who have all your data, justice privatized, mm -hmm. you know. So, in many ways, I think one of the kind of enigmas of history and of, of the present is that dystopias come into being right under your nose and you don't even mm. notice it because it's been repackaged mm. in a different way. And surely one aspect of that, I mean, who, I mean, even 25, 30 years ago could have reckoned that the entire ritual of contemporary mass society is bound up simply in the fact that you cannot factor prime numbers. I mean... Alain Badiou saw it coming with his view that mathematics is ontology, but now mathematics really is ontology. Your reality is comprised by the fact that you can't factor prime numbers. Fuck the golden mean and the ancient Greeks. Ours is the most tightly mm -hmm. geared mathematico-technological culture you've ever seen in the world. Somebody just has to crack public key encryption and the whole fucking bang shoe will come down in a, in a fraction of a second. <laughs> it seems like kind of an, an interesting kind of almost almost contrast with what you were talking about earlier, like the the, the existence of the novel as a form and the, as sort of being in some way um, sort of dead and sort of limited by the, the sort of the physical object. Because I thought, particularly when reading the uh, the the war sections, how well the the style lent itself to to getting across so many of these ideas and so much of the kind of um the sort of the technological chaos um of, of yeah the well i mean the, the form and the style of the books is is meant to to demonstrate that they're, they're meant to they're, they're focalized through human consciousnesses but the, mm -hmm. these are humans living in a technological world uh, uh, shall i read a passage yeah, yeah that would be great. shall i read a passage <laughs> <laughs> so now i'll show you um so yeah, one of the one of the protect four protagonists of the novel is this man Jonathan Daath, and he kind of belongs to the you know, among other things, this trilogy of novels like is like my Forsyth saga. It's a multi generational saga. So he's in fact the great nephew of the protagonist of the first novel, and he is a MI6 secret intelligence service operative. He also happens to be a closeted gay man, who. Uh, has a succession of beards to protect his status while he has this long-term affair with a British, similarly closeted British tank commander. But in this little scene, he's uh, on his way to Iraq to deal with some problems uh, associated with the Iraq war. Oh, I've got another mic. I've got two mics. I'm now going to perform the extraordinary feat of reading from this novel aloud with my stomach. I <laughs> think <laughs> 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 uh, that's probably right. phone. It's a fresh morning for June and standing at the dropping off point, sucking on a final gasper, the butcher 
feels goosebumps on his recently showered skin and the crepitation of his kippered lungs. It's always been a problem, dressing for these sorts of trips. Ones in which he'll traverse 20 or 30 degrees Celsius in less than 24 hours. Squinting towards the low rise of the Chiltern Hills through his Marlborough smoke, he smiles wryly, remembering the reversible jackets and other sapper-esque stratagems he'd adopted as a young intelligence branch officer. No need for that malarkey nowadays. Besides, there are some occasions on which it's best to be BE YOURSELF! BE SPONTANEOUS! He remembers years ago coming back from the S-Bahn at the Hackescher Markt. The wall had only been down a couple of years and the middle of Berlin was full of all sorts of riffraff watchers too. Close to his hotel a street whore stopped him, some poor double denim refugee fleeing the fashion disaster which had been the old Soviet bloc. Be yourself, she'd cried to the cold night air, her corpse breath sullying life itself, while her hand, clutching his overcoat sleeve, had been tendoned with track marks, precocious of her to have acquired a bad habit so well. Be yourself, be spontaneous, she'd urged him, and he'd laughed in her face. Fuck off, Christian F., which had been most unfair, for how could she possibly have realised the careful planning it required each and every day to be this self, that self, any bloody self at all? At security, in Terminal 4, the plastic tray bumps to a halt, leaving the rollers spinning. And the butcher thinks of blue stones hauled all the way from the Prezeli Hills, for this situation is pretty fucking Stone Age. The rollers are still spinning as the woman in front of him expertly hefts her baby through the metal detector's arch, and spying her little Dior clutch bag rocking to a halt, snatches it up. But the security staff are having none of this. Excuse me, madam, has the force of a command from the one with severely pinned brown hair who's no doubt childless. Standing on the other side of the arch, watching the playlet unfold, the butcher admires the fluidity of their union, woman and accessory, then thinks of his girlfriend, Sally, who doesn't realise he's well aware of her little subterfuge, the pill long since neglected, the diaphragm no longer inserted. It's greediness, he thinks, her hands on his meagre buttocks, yanking him into her. His sperm is an ingredient she needs to make her own baby. His climax is of no moment at all. Why would you care if the fridge experiences pleasure when you get the milk out. <laughs> the security guard wears elbow-length Prezelli blue rubber gloves. The fashionable woman holds the FA cup aloft, offering it to be frisked with perfect equanimity. She understands there's no statute of limitations. Radicalization might happen in the womb. Although nothing as radical as what Sally hopes for, the demographic bouleversement of a spinster birth. Over brunch at the Wolseley, she's broached the question, dipping her brioche, her own increasingly doughy features, yellowy, envious. She's spoken of cycles, treatments, what might be available on the NHS, and he's Batted such things aside, she'll have to go. He sees her, quite happy, in the provinces. True, there'll have to be numerous cycles. Around and around they'll go, hormones cranking her reproductive machinery again and again. But at long last, there'll be the dividend, a beautiful pink and burbling trophy. Sally holds out to be taken by her sweetly boring husband. The butcher has had such a fate in mind for this, let's face it, 
grey beard pushing three years now. The pattern is well established. The butcher will introduce her to some sheepily good-natured fellow who, feeling forever sexually enthralled to her, he's not that attractive and what with the workout her former lover put her through, much less erotically sophisticated, will remain dutiful, faithful and more importantly utterly incurious would you step through the detector now please sir says the other one who's equally lardy assed but with hair tied up in a turban and suddenly tiring of the charade the butcher flashes his diplomatic passport and steps around the arch there's a brief flurry of concern a supervisor comes scampering along the production lines of fear then the butcher's gone striding past other transiting souls who unbelted and unlaced are doing the perp walk of late capitalism past glassy walls of whiskey bottles and wire baskets full of stuffed animals and neck cushions <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to, in a minute, hand over to the audience because I suspect there will be some questions for you. But um, the last thing I'd like to talk about, uh, I, I think it was in the Guardian review, um, the, the journalist wrote that, he said, phone isn't an attempt to inhabit the language of modernism, but an attempt to exhaust a style. Um, and I was just... That. Yeah, I thought that was utter bollocks. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, it's like, I remember the, the London Review of Books review for um, Umbrella, it went on at length about the Uncle Charles principle, the idea in Joyce, you know, that Joyce writes in Ulysses, Uncle Charles repaired to the outhouse, mm -hmm. and critics who didn't grasp that the entire text was being focalised through a character mm -hmm. couldn't get that this was Uncle Charles's language, not Joyce's, you mm -hmm. know, so... And I've had this problem with these novels as well, with these really quite eminent critics. Mm -hmm. I mean, the person in the Guardian was utterly mad, and, and their <laughs> misapprehension of the text rests on their delicious assumption that my protagonist hasn't read Joyce mm -hmm. or Eliot. Why the fuck wouldn't he have read Joyce mm -hmm. and Eliot? I mean, you know, he's a 78-year-old Hampstead intellectual. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely ridiculous. You'd have to have an alternative world in which he hadn't mm -hmm. read them. And, <laughs> So I'm not attempting to exhaust the, the style. The allusions to the high modernists mm -hmm. are what you might expect to find in the mind of people who had been shaped, mm -hmm. at least in part, by the modernist tradition themselves. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's not a, a retro-modernism. It's a turbo-modernism. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I think you just answered the question I was going to ask already. So, I think, um, so I'm going to hand over um, to the audience. If you have a question for Will, get your hand up. We'll get a microphone to you so everyone can hear you. Let's begin with that gentleman just over there. I noticed as you were reading, I, I noticed your right hand and how it was moving. This is what I do. I notice these strange things. And it looked like you were plucking a guitar I I at moments. So which leads me to the question, does music play a part in the way you write in any way, shape, or form? Yes. I mean, in, in all sorts of ways. I tend to... I don't know a lot about um, musical theory, but I know a bit. I tend to think of the way I build these books in particular as being more akin to modal music than it is to conventional linear prose. Or linear, and I try and build in harmonies, I try and build in counterpoint between voices and between... Yeah, all of that is present. I'm a... I'm, as I say, I'm not a kind of hugely learned in music, but I'm a fan. And uh, I think that the kind of music of the world is very present in the books as well. And I think, you know, one of the real problems that contemporary writers have of giving any real naturalism to what they write is that they tend to ignore the fact that most people's heads really are full of earworms of a of, of very short duration. And I certainly try and get that. I tend to shape all of these three novels as shaped around a kind of core constellation of works and each of the books has a signature melody attached to it that returns again and again that's you know my equivalent of Van Toy's sonata in Alla Recherche du Temps Perdu uh, so yeah 
lots of music and the wiggling the hand uh yeah whatever <laughs> you know it's it, try and get a rhythm to the reading try and yeah i'm a thwarted conductor <laughs> like aren't we all <laughs> and just to pick up on that actually i mean one the umbrella opens with one of these earworms uh from mm. from the the kinks and eight man um and which again comes back into into phone i mean that seems to have been one that sort of uh shaped um uh, shaped shaped certain ideas in the novel or, or rather was responding to certain mm. ideas and it because and i went back to the song because in fact thanks to this book you mm. uh you put that song in my head so i kind of thought i might be able to exercise it by listening to it and it's very disturbing isn't it, it, it <laughs> at is. many levels yeah 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 for, i mean i wasn't entirely sure how um politically correct it would be considered today it would be considered <laughs> totally unpolitically correct but it's one of those politically incorrect things where you have to join the dots with your own mm. inner racist mm. <laughs> to, to make the problem mm. and when you make it you're then defiled by the association those davis brothers they have a lot to answer for but beyond that the lyric of mm. the song is of course yes completely uh, what i'm saying uh -huh. <laughs> so it's going Somewhat paradoxically. Mm -hmm. Okay, more more questions for Will. Don't be shy. Well, if I am shy, I'm shy too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, lady right at the back there. We'll just get a microphone to you. Hi. Hi. So uh, you said something that the West is very old, and I was wondering... Do you think that Western society has a crisis in art world because of this? Well, I think there are two problems with art in the West at the moment. One is the vast age of the population, so that kills the idea of an avant-garde on one level because avant-gardes need to be made by intergenerational rebellion. The second problem with art in the West is that we do live in cultures that are decadent in a, in a particular and narrow sense, which is that there, we live in a in societies in which you can say anything you want. Any there are no longer any sexual or social taboos, and we've invented media that will channel our darkest fantasies straight to our heads. And the third problem is commoditization, which is that we've determined to place a value on absolutely everything that is solely a monetary and exchange value, and therefore we're a completely fetishized, commodity fetishized society, which is the death of uh, of art as well. So yeah, it's a real problem. If I was your age i'd like stab an old guy <laughs> uh, just just kind of casually and when asked why you did it just say because he was fucking old you know just <laughs> taking up the space yeah <laughs> anymore and then you know you could just say it's not gratuit that you're an artist <laughs> it's the only art that's possible under these extreme conditions when you know you can't afford to live in the center of most major western cities you the gig economy means that you you're you're treated as if your body were a little business that you had to run for life there's no sense of civic engagement that's meaningful to people we're living in, in increasingly inegalitarian societies you should revolt don't stand for it <laughs> Which makes me think, actually, with... But not violently, gently, <laughs> in a calm voice. Possibly wearing quite furry suits that you get from, you know, a fancy dress shop so that people won't think it's too heavy or anything, because there's enough violence in the world, right? Mm. The, um, the... The kind of the, the let's say the, the arc of these books sort of spans sort of more, or less, more or less a century from uh, the end of the First World War up to the, the Second Iraq War. And even, even though they were all sort of written and like conceived of before sort of Brexit and before Trump, in, in a way, I guess, reading, particularly reading phone after um, the, the sort of the, uh, the events of the previous few years, they, it, it, it seems almost like a kind of a warning of the the direction of the, our societies were taking. No, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think, y you know, a warning presupposes the idea that you can do anything about it. Mm. And I suspect you really can't. I mean, if you look at the world now, the interlinkage of large technologically dependent systems that provide... You know, for example, I heard an interview the other night on the radio with 
uh, after a particularly big cyber attack on the National Health Service in Britain. And he, he said, look, the point is that the, most of the cable routing, the heavy infrastructure of the, Briti of the British computer system is over 25 years, and it had not old, and it hasn't been replaced. He said, if you knew how fucked up the basic infrastructure is, you wouldn't even sleep at night. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and you think of the interdependency of these systems and the inherent propensity towards entropy and chaos in human endeavor and you wouldn't sleep at all if you actually conceptualize it it's whatever you want to think about water power air traffic control no matter where you go with this mm -hmm. uh is, is no good news so and you know i think you should cultivate your garden i think you mm -hmm. should you know because uh, you know i i, I think that that I've become very quietistic politically, partly because of this, and and I think anyway, as a quietist, if you think about it, if everybody just did good things, the world would be a good place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? On the uh, grand scale, we're kind of ape men in above our heads. Almost. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Let's just get back to the you know the little ape acts of mm -hmm. kindness and mm -hmm. stop worrying about the grand vision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we've got time for one or two more questions. Anybody there for us? Yeah. Uh, we'll run a microphone up to you quickly. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm a musician as well, and I want to come back to the last question, actually, that art is dying. I think, I don't think that art is dying, I think artists are dying, because I think everything has been already kind of written, and we don't have so much ideas anymore, in a way, to somehow say something new and that's why we are just like we don't find really new ideas and that's why we say that actually art is dying but I don't think so I mean music and paintings and all these things I mean they have I don't think that there have been so much money into the art as it is in this century I mean if you just go to the Philharmonic or Opera House and tickets are just like up to fi 500 euro I mean who would pay in Mozart's time 500 euro for a ticket? No one. And I can only remember only one composer who had a lot of money because his family was kind of with a lot of money. That was Mendelssohn, isn't it? No? Mendelssohn, yeah. <laughs> so, and all the writers, they were like kind of in Russia and all this stuff, they were all like hungry. Yeah, that's not art, that's uh, culture, and to quote somebody who might be one of your countrymen, when I hear the word culture, I reach for my gun. Culture? Yeah, you're not talking about art, you're talking about culture. Uh, well, I mean, people create art and culture, and art is one of the things with culture which is coming, it's like a bonus, no? Uh, no, culture is, is the form that art takes when it's institutionalized. So you're talking about people going and spending a lot of money for concert tickets or spending a lot of money for art. That's the institutionalization. I, I That's not the art itself. What you have to look at is the quality of the work. And, and actually, you've said your own speech because you began by saying people found it very hard to say new things because they felt that everything had been done before and then your example of art was in fact classical music which is usually just people paying a lot of money to see pieces that were written many hundred years ago played by virtuosi now so you you fulfilled your own prophecy within your own speech so I mean um, I'm a musician but I love to read I love to go to museums and I actually buy a lot of books and I mean it's not something that I don't think that culture and art is very far away from what I said. I mean, I was speaking about art and about culture as well at the same time because it's connected to each other, I think. Well, which is your true opinion? Do you believe that art is in trouble because it's difficult for it to remain relevant to this society in particular ways or do you think art's very healthy because of this sign of a large culture industry? It's for you to make the decision. You know, I mean, you're critiquing my view, but I'm not quite sure where you're coming from exactly, because you seem a little bit confused. Me? Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, it, what you seem to feel was, I mean, the other way of looking at what you said, and I don't mean to be 
you know a kind of nasty old patriarchal man is that you're you're just offering a familiar argument which is a very Im empirical sample of one person which is you and that's the way you feel about things but I'm talking about a kind of collective situation in in the society that I do believe art is highly commoditized now and uh, there's a sense around every you know you know every artistic transaction you can smell money around it you know and and even in the kind of early 1980s when I was probably around your age and started working as a writer and, and an artist I could live in central London for 25 pounds or 30 pounds a week I virtually did hardly any work at all I had months and years to ferment my artistic imagination there was very little sense of pressure uh, you know, people weren't constantly, young people weren't constantly going, you know, what do you do now? And have you got property yet? And have you done that? I, I, I do feel very much for young people who don't have money behind them in this society or, or don't, frankly, don't have a lot of money. Because that's what you need. You need a lot of money to be kind of arty and cultured today. Uh, because you simply can't even afford to be in the metropolitan areas where you might make the connections with people to enhance your imagination. And so, no, I, I disagree with you. Okay. Also, you just have to look around you, with the possible exception of my own novels. Most of it's shit. <laughs> 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 On which note? <laughs> um, and having talked about the commodification, I think when I now give my speech about how everyone should go and buy yeah. this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> um, but that is unfortunately all we've got time for. We do have uh, piles and piles of Will's books up at the uh, till uh, phone, obviously, but also Umbrella Shark and I think more or less all of the backlist. Um, so please do uh, pick up a copy. I'm sure Will would uh, sign them for you. Um, otherwise, um, do stick around, have a glass of wine with us. Um, and one more time, please join me in thanking Will Self.